Good morning, church. God is good all the time, even when people break in and steal your stuff, right? God is good. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it's an interesting uh, dynamic to come into on Sabbath morning. I actually got a call from our worship leader about 7.20 this morning saying, um, I think somebody, took, uh, somebody broke in. Our drums are missing from the platform. And uh, so... And then we discovered more and more and more. And uh, so, but uh, we'll pray that God's will will be done and we'll go with whatever God's going to do in this situation. Be good. Um, we often say God is good all the time. And sometimes I'll change the word every once in a while. I want to do that this morning as well. God is present all the time. Okay. God is present all the time. and all the time. God is change it a little bit. God is with us. And all the time? All right, you're tracking, you're tracking well. You're tracking well. We've been uh, focusing on Job for this month of June. Uh, topics like when life seems to be falling apart, confronting worldly wisdom. Last week, Pastor Aaron with lifelong learners and, and looking at our VBS theme. I liked our theme for VBS, which was, remember? Roar and God is good. Yeah, God is good. It's important to roar, but God is good, all right? And the weekly themes, when life changes, God is good. When life is scary, God is good. when life is sad, God is good. when life is unfair, God is good. and when life is good, God is good, right? All the time, <laughs> all the time. Well, Job has been arguing with God and his friends. He's been crying out to God. And we now get to the part in Job, verses 30, chapters 38 and 39, where God shows up. God shows up in the whirlwind, it says, and he begins talking to Job. But he doesn't come to Job and say, all right, Job, well, here's how it is. Let me answer all your questions. Like a good teacher, he gives answers in what form? Questions. He then comes with questions and doesn't just start spitting out answers, but he has questions like a good teacher and God being the greatest teacher there is, or greatest rabbi we could have, ask Job questions. And so in Job chapter 38 and 39, and I did not have the projectionist put this up because there's a lot to it, but in Job 38 and 39, I just want to highlight some things. If you have a Bible or if you don't, there's one in front of you or should be, um, and where the rack is, or if you have your device and you just want to pull it up, I'm going to just highlight some things. In chapter 38, I'm in the New Living Translation. It says, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? How'd you like that first question? <laughs> Who is this? Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Welcome to class. <laughs> Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Where were you, Job? Where were you when all that took place? He goes on, and who kept the sea inside its boundaries? What about all the waves? Who commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise to the, to the east and daylight spread to the ends of the earth? Bring an end to the night's wickedness and the light approaches. Springs from which the seas come. Do you realize the extent of the earth, Job? Tell me about it if you know. Where does the light come from? Where does the darkness go? But of course, in verse 21 it says, but of course you know all this. For you were born before it was all created, and you were so very experienced. <laughs> wow. Talks about s snow and hail and the source of light and the east wind and the rain, lightning, the dew, the ice, the frost, the movement of the stars, Pleiades and Orion, the laws of the universe, the clouds, lightning, the intuition of the heart and the instinct of the mind the lioness, the ravens, the deer. He even brings out the wild donkey, the wild ox, and the ostrich, and the horse. 
the hawk and the eagle. God has just kind of given him this vast experience of creation and his creatures. And we're not going to get into 40 and 41, but in verse 40, he talks about the behemoth. And he gives a whole chapter, chapter 41, to Leviathan. To Leviathan, the sea creature that's a, kind of a mystery to us. And God comes in with these questions and says, so Job, what do you know about all this stuff? Do you understand? Can you even comprehend this whole thing called life and, and breath and creation and the wonders that I've created? I thought it would be a good idea since God answered Job with questions about his creation and all the wonders of it, it would be good for us to kind of be in awe and wonder of some of the things that he did, some of the things that he brought up, and maybe some of the things that he didn't. I want to look, first of all, at the universe. I always like to just have my mind blown by the universe. Just, I mean, it's just amazing. Astronomer Dr. Peter Edwards explains the majesty of the universe this way. You will never, he says, ever get your head around how big the universe is. It is just enormous. There is no way I think that the human mind can comprehend the true immensity of the universe. We are happy with the size of an elephant or the size of a tree or maybe even the size of a cathedral. But we, if we go beyond that, our brains just start to run out of gas. He said, we pointed the Hubble telescope at what appeared to be a very ordinary patch of the night sky. If you imagine holding up your finger with a grain of sand on it and looking at it, the patch of sky that that grain of sand blocks out, that's the field that the Hubble telescope zoomed in on. So imagine you have a, just one grain of sand on your finger and you hold it up to the night sky. And that patch of sky that the sand blocks is where they pointed the Hubble telescope. He says, what the telescope saw was incredible. There are 10,000 galaxies in a patch of sky the size of the grain of sand held at arm's length. 10,000 galaxies. If this tiny patch of sky is like every other, then we can calculate how many galaxies are out there. The visible universe contains around 100 billion galaxies. Each one of those galaxies contains around 100 billion stars. That means the visible universe contains something like, and I don't even get this, 10,000 million, million, million stars. Are you getting all this? Yeah. Your brain ran out of gas like mine did a little while ago, right? This means there are more stars in the visible universe than there are grains of sand on the entire earth. Wow. God of wonders. Amazing. Or maybe you've heard of the X structure at the core of the Whirlpool galaxy. The Whirlpool galaxy is around 30 million light years away, tucked inside the X structure. The dark X marks the spot of a black hole so big its size is equal to one million of our suns. It's so big that it's 1,100 light years across. And isn't it just kind of neat that the X looks like a cross? As scientists go looking and searching what they can learn, they, they go and they find this X. They call it an X. We'll call it a cross. Of God just reminding us of his wonder. Okay, God brought up the ostrich. So let's be in wonder about the ostrich. The ostrich has three stomachs. I like that. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have three stomachs? I mean, a good Italian should have three stomachs, right? One for the pasta, one for the <laughs> garlic bread, the gelato. Yes, the gelato for the third one. Oh, man. While the ostrich is flightless, it's the largest bird in the world. God is funny too, isn't he? Ostriches can run up to 45 miles per hour, covering up to five meters in one single stride. Wow. An ostrich's wingspan is about six and a half feet. Their eggs are the largest of any living bird, weighing as much as two dozen chicken eggs and about six inches long. And I believe it seems that they can see 360 degrees to watch for predators. And I like it. They, they, they never fight. They run. <laughs> right? If a lion comes by, they, I mean, they could kick it pretty hard. They could do some damage, but they just, 45 miles an hour, they're gone. Gone. And then I just, now this wasn't in Job, but I just... This, this bird always blows me away, the woodpecker. The woodpecker is amazing. Listen to this. 
like a human repeatedly running face first into a tree at full speed. <laughs> Can you just imagine that? Running full face. We're on Pine Springs Ranch Retreat, right? By the way, why did you laugh when he mentioned me in the picture? <laughs> I noticed that was the only one you laughed at. I'm just saying. But imagine running full speed into a tree with your face. A woodpecker can hit a tree trunk 100 times per minute at the rate of up to 15 miles per hour. While a human would probably end up in the hospital right after the first hit. The funeral home. <laughs> it has some Dane Bramage, right? An average of 12,000 times per day. And will still live for over 10 years. The deceleration forces from such repeated impacts reach an incredible 1,000 Gs and places extraordinary stresses upon the neck, you think, skeleton, and face of these birds. These scientists in Hong Kong, Polytechnic University, observed slow motion footage of the woodpeckers. They assessed their skills, created computer simulations to understand exactly what happens when a woodpecker strikes a tree. The supportive bone looping around the skull is like a safety belt to prevent brain damage while the upper and lower bills are of different lengths, lessening the transmission of forces. Very interesting. Finally, certain bones of the skull have spongy plate-like structures that distribute incoming forces and reduce any stress that would otherwise be placed on the brain. All in all, the head and neck of a woodpecker work together to keep the bird in top shape despite its lifestyle. <laughs> That's what we need. We need bodies that keep us in top shape in spite of our lifestyles, right? Now, here's something I didn't know. The tail of a woodpecker, maybe you knew this, but the tail of a woodpecker has sharp spikes that dig into the bark of a tree so that as the woodpecker is there working his way in the tree, it's like a, it's like a kickstand that just kind of anchors him right into the tree, which is really cool. They also have bristles or soft feathers placed around their nostrils to protect them from the nasal damage. Special air sacs also filter dust away from the bird's nostrils. They have, they have a third eyelid that protects them. Every time before they hit the tree, the third eyelid closes, but it's see-through so they can see what they're doing as they do this. Isn't God amazing? I mean, just a woodpecker. What a stud. <laughs> He's amazing. Okay, another one. The hummingbird. I love the hummingbird. Hummingbird is amazing. This, uh, there are 325 unique hummingbird species in the world. 325. God is so creative. The average hummingbird weighs three grams. So just in comparison, a nickel is five grams, right? It would take more than 150 hummingbirds to weigh one pound. The hummingbird has an incre incredibly high heart rate, right? The average heart rate in flight is 1,200 beats per minute. 1,200 beats per minute. I would explode. <laughs> the resting heart rate for hummingbird, 250 beats per minute. Can you imagine trying to rest at 250 beats per minute? Whew. Maximum forward flight speed is 30 miles an hour and can reach up to 60 miles per hour in a dive. Now, I love this. In her book, Birdology, Cy Montgomery describes it like this. Diving at 385 body lengths per second it bests the space shuttle as it screams down through the atmosphere at 207 body lengths per second. That is fast. 385 body lengths. A hummingbird's wings beat between 50 and 200 flaps per second, depending, depending on the direction of flight. And uh, this is my favorite fact about the hummingbirds. A hummingbird must consume half its body weight in sugar every day. Wouldn't that be amazing? Half of your body weight in sugar every day and not affect you in a negative way. Amazing. All right. <clears throat> oh, I wanted to show you just because it was fun. Uh, the other picture, like, yeah, I shared this with you about a year ago. We, uh, we had the blessing of having the hummingbird uh, nest in our backyard last year. And it was so cool just to watch, watch it develop, to watch the eggs and to watch them hatch. And then it was such a sad day when they left. Uh, but just such a, such a, I want to see it on the big screen. Yeah, it was, that was special. That was a special gift from God. All right, finally, the last one, the whale. The whale spend 95% of their lives in the ocean, one of the deepest, darkest places we know about. Without warning, 
they pull 30,000 pounds of blubber against gravity and leap out of the water for unexplainable reasons. Some baby whales, this one, this, some baby whales gain 100 pounds an hour while nursing. Can you imagine gaining 100 pounds per hour? Holy cow. I don't even want to think of how many hours you have to spend in the gym to try to work that out, right? <laughs> the song of a humpback whale lasting for 10 to 20 minutes and being repeated for hours at a time is produced for no apparent reason. Biologists speculate it may be related to mating, but truthfully, no one is quite sure. The reason they breach is also a mystery. For show, for mating, for fun, there are speculations, but no one really knows why. Maybe God was just having fun with the whale and just reminding us that we can't control everything. I don't know if you've ever seen whales before, but I've seen them from the land. I haven't been as close, but at the beach one time in San Diego, just looking out and seeing the whales just breaching and leaping out there off of Del Mar, it was just, it was just amazing. It made me want to worship, you know? Or I've had the wonderful pleasure of surfing at times and finding a dolphin next to you in the wave, you know, and how, how precious that was, you know? And, and just experience that. God is just, just amazing. So God comes to Job, and he reminds him of his wonder. And I, I, know I wonder, we're sitting here looking at things on a screen. We're looking at a still picture. But I just wonder if when God was with Job, he didn't just talk to him, but he was like showing him things, you know, like in real time, imagining all of these things. And Job is just like, oh, my goodness. And that's why I love, I'm not going to talk about it too much, but I love at the end of the book of Job, Job says, I've always heard about you, but now I've seen you. Now I've seen you with my own eyes. To experience the wonder of God and to realize this life is so much bigger than how we want to just make sense out of everything. You know, when something is too big and too wonderful, you can't describe it all. You can't explain it all. You just experience it in awe and wonder. You know, kind of like in the book of Revelation and, and when people come to, to, to when angels come to, to people and messengers come to people and it's like they're just in awe. They're speechless. Or maybe that's why, too, in the book of Revelation, John says, it was like this. Maybe it wasn't exactly what he saw, but it was like this. It's the best way I can describe it in human earthly terms. And so this life, when we really get steeped in this life, sometimes, how do you explain it? And God is coming to Job saying, it's all much more complex than you can understand. But the good news is, Job, is that I showed up, that I'm here. The good news of Job is that God comes to Job. He didn't have to. He comes to Job and he talks to Job. God, who's done all of this, he doesn't need to come and talk to a mere mortal, but he comes and he talks to Job. And he reveals himself in such a way that Job sees him. God, God of wonders, he comes and is present. You see, <clears throat> while we can be enamored in awe of the universe and of the ostrich and the woodpecker and the whales and all the things of creation. Church, may we never, ever stop being in awe of the wonder that God, out of all the things he did, came in the flesh to this world. That he came in the person of Jesus Christ, flesh, but that he left all of heaven and came down, and that that God, our God, didn't just walk around and make everything better, but he entered into our suffering, and that he himself went to the cross. That he himself experienced the depths of the worst type of suffering any human could experience, and that is what the Bible refers to as the second death separation from God. He experienced that so that you and I don't ever have to experience that. That's good news, church. You don't ever have to experience separation from God. Ever. 
not even death will separate us from his love. And so Jesus went to the cross. Jesus, before he even went to the cross in Gethsemane, was crying out, God, if it's possible, take this away, but not my will, your will be done. He knew what it was like to suffer. And the other wonder, the great wonder is that God is so awesome that death, the Bible says, could not hold him down, that he rose again. The resurrection, the empty tomb, to me, church, that's the greatest wonder of the world, is that our God is not in the tomb, but he has risen, and he's coming back again. Church, in the busyness of this life, in the struggles of this life, let's not lose sight of the wonder of our God, yes, in creation, but even more so in Jesus Christ, his cross, and his resurrection. That when we're struggling day in and day out sometimes, don't lose sight of the beauty and the wonder that your God has provided a way so that you will never be separated from him. Not now and not for all of eternity. See, the reason the gospel is such good news is because God showed up. God came and he spoke to us and he continues to speak to us. And you know what, church? I got to tell you, in this season of suffering our church seems to be going through, I got to tell you that as I spend time with people who are experiencing cancer and tragic accidents and so forth, I'm the one who's being ministered to. I'm the one who's growing as an apprentice to Jesus because of your faithfulness and because of your testimony of God's presence in their lives. When I talk to all of them, they testify of God's presence in their life, that he has not left them or forsaken them, but that he is with them every moment, all the time, and experience them in different ways. I want to share with you a quote from C.S. Lewis. It's from the book Screwtape Letters. If you've never read, read the Screwtape Letters, do yourself a favor and read the book. The premise is that C.S. Lewis writes this book that this, this demon, Screwtape, is mentoring a younger demon, Wormwood, on how to go about his business. And he writes this. It's one of the most famous books, quotes from the book. It's from pages 39 and 40. He says, he says, do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemies, enemy is God, our enemies will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. Whew, let me read that to you again. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. Wow. Knowing God is there even when we don't feel him. Knowing God is there even when it seems like he's not. Is it possible that God's presence can go beyond our consciousness? I think so. He's God. He goes beyond our limitations, and he is there. He goes beyond our limitations. Just, again, look at Jesus. God becoming flesh. God going to the cross for us. God dying. God rising again. He goes beyond our limitations and what we can understand. I was talking with Grace Kim this week, and she gave me permission to share this. She said, I have been surrounded by readings of Job. Michael Card, who was with us at the retreat and wrote a book that she's been reading, wrote that worship includes the lament and sorrow expressed by Job. Even though I haven't gone through half the suffering as Job, she says, I'm learning each day being faithful is just to communicate with him. See, God is in it with us, and God wants us to communicate, and this is, it's okay if we're angry with God, we're sad, we're lamenting, we're confused, we're whatever it is, God wants us to talk about it with him. God wants us to share it with him. 
You know, sometimes, and I don't want to get into a whole topic on prayer, but sometimes, sometimes we might think, well, why do we even need to pray? If God already knows everything and God's going to do whatever he's going to do anyways, why do we need to, why do we need to pray? Well, let me tell you, I hope, I hope my kids know that I'm going to take care of them, that I'm looking out for them, but I still want to talk with them and have a relationship with them. It's like, oh, well, dad's going to take care of us. Mom's going to take you. Well, we don't need to talk to them. You know, things will just show up. Food will be on the table. Clothes will be there. You know, my car will run, blah, blah, blah. I don't need to talk to them. What kind of relationship is that? And God is saying, I'm here. Talk with me. If you're ticked off, give it to me. See, that's why the book of Psalms is so good to learn how to, how to, how to communicate with God. Because David's mad, sad, glad, hurt, everything, he's rejoicing, it's all there. I think that's why God says he's a man after my own heart. Because he's real. And he shares it all with me. And he's vulnerable. And church, don't forget, when we talk about the wonders of God, you are one of them. You are one of them. We can talk about the hummingbird, bird, the woodpecker, the universe, but how do you make a human being? How do you make a human being? It's mind-blowing when you, I know those of you who have studied the body, it's, it's miraculous. I still remember when our kids were being born, I remember going through the, the birthing classes, you know, we're learning how to breathe. <laughs> I remember getting so overwhelmed one time watching one of those videos going, oh my goodness, I'm going to be a dad. <laughs> this is, they're they're going to trust me with this, this human being. And I remember, I remember just when our kids were born, just like, oh, this is amazing. And you don't realize sometimes how much can go, actually go wrong. And it's a miracle, the act of birth. And don't forget how fearfully and wonderfully made you are. Let me just share from Psalm 139, Living Translation. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. And such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Listen to this next verse, church. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I want to pause right there. Because I want to say that probably most, if not all of us, have forgotten how precious God's thoughts are about you. Every single day. So much so that they cannot be numbered. He says, I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, what does it say? You are still with me. When I wake up, you are still with me. Church, no matter what we're going through, we sleep at night, wake up in the morning, challenges, hardships, whatever it might be, the good news is that God is still with you. Just as God came to Job and Job was free to lament, free to complain, free to argue, and God came to him. You know, sometimes when people are complaining and whining, what do we like to do? Stay away. What does God do? He comes close. So know that sometimes when you're grieving and you're struggling and maybe you're even complaining, God doesn't run from you. He comes closer. He comes close. Because that's the type of God that he is. 
And so maybe these wonders of the world and these creations are things that God might use to remind us, I'm with you. I'm not a God that just spits out creation. I'm not a machine. I'm a personal being. And you are fearfully, wonderfully made. Just like the details of the woodpecker and the hummingbird and all these other animals and the universe know that every detail in you I intentionally created. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that whatever you go through, I'm committed to be with you. That no matter what you go through, I will still be there. I will still be there. And ultimately, when it's all said and done, I've done what needs to be done so that you will never be separated from me for all of eternity. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you today thanking you for your faithfulness thanking you that no matter what happens in this life, no matter what the enemy throws at us, you will always be there. And just as you and yourself took everything the enemy could throw at you, all the powers of evil, so that you experienced separation from the Father, We thank you that that did not overcome you, but you overcame all of evil, all that the devil could throw at you so that we would never be separated from you forever. So please, Lord, we ask for the grace to have courage and to trust that even if we don't feel you, even if we don't sense you, you are there, that you can be with us even beyond our comprehension. And may your creation around us, the birds, the galaxy, the whales, the ostriches, anything else, but even so, our friends and our family and our relationships who are fearfully and wonderfully made, and ourself, may it remind us of your wonders that you, you are with us. You are with us. Would you take a moment now in silent prayer to just be still and to know he is with you. And now as we go, may we go knowing this week that the God of wonders is with you always, forever. God bless you.